We're going to go from the big picture of Ukraine's financial challenges that you heard about in the last panel to two panels that will be discussing military capabilities and the situation on the ground. And to put it, to put it frankly and starkly, who is winning and who has more time? And I think those are two slogans, but they are very powerful ways of encapsulating something important. I think we have a lot of discussions here about the need for Ukraine to win, which is right. But we need to be realistic and honest about what the situation is right now. And so I would like this conversation, which has on it an un... You couldn't have a better panel to discuss this honestly and openly. What is the situation right now? And then secondly, this very important question of is time on Russia's side or is time on the side of Ukraine? The longer this war goes on, who benefits more? And I think the answer is not obvious. So we should discuss both of those. So let's start, uh, Minister Umerov, with you. Give me, give us all, an honest assessment right now, and I will push you if I think you're not being honest, of who is winning. Well, uh, at the moment, we didn't start the war, but we have regained back our territory. Uh, the territories that has been temporarily occupied, we're still uh, pushing in the Navy out to their part of the uh, world. So basically, we opened up a grain corridor. We uh, uh, destroyed the Navy. We've pushed out of several regions. Uh, so we have a defensive operation. We have a stabilization operations. And we've just made an uh, offensive operation. So uh, we're on a right track. But uh, the issue is how effective and efficient we are. It, depends on our partners as well, because it depends on the resources and it depends on the support that we gain from the partners, because Russia is also getting support from the evil uh, excess of evil. So that is why it, uh, it's a questionable, it's a question to the society and to the partners as well. Um, you're absolutely right that you're, what you have done in naval terms, in terms of weakening and pushing out uh, the Russian Navy is extraordinary in the Black Sea, and un, un, unquestionably a huge success. Talk to me about the second one you mentioned, the incursion of Kursk. What is the strategic goal there, and are you achieving it? Uh, as I've uh, sometimes explained it to the uh, experts before, at the beginning of year, we've said that uh, Russia is going to form a new brigade. Until the end of the year, they will increase up to 400,000 people. They will increase the numbers of their brigades, and they are going to start the offensive in the north-northeast. So for this reason, we needed to start a mobilization. Uh, we started to uh, create operational reserve and strategic reserve uh, to have a power. So we have dealt with Kharkiv, and we did not allow Russians to go inside of uh, Ukraine, so we repelled them. When we saw that they are building, a, uh, they want to create a buffer zone uh, from Kharkiv until Belarus uh, border, and they have uh, opened up uh, their, let's say, um, capabilities or their potentials in there. So we use this and we maneuver it. So we take uh, advantage of it. So uh, with this, we, A, did not allow them to create a buffer zone. B, we have pushed them out to 700 kilometers away, not to bomb and terrorize our cities. C, uh, we have also shown that we are capable to bring the war they brought to our land uh, back to them. So that's very clear. You have certainly uh, shown them that you can do offensive defense. You have, you have affected and, and changed the mood here. You have made a big change in what seems static. But to achieve your other objectives in Kursk, do you need to hold the territory you now have? Or have you made your point? And if you retreat, you've still made your point. I ask because the Russians, as I understand it, are now putting much more pressure on you in Kursk. 
We already got used to 30 years of uh, questions to our states, whether we are European, whether we are in NATO, where we are able. So it's always a questionable issue. What we say directly, we will punch back. You come to us, you have a plan, we will. Uh, you, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. So we will punch back. We're able, we're capable, and we're doing it. You, you certainly shown that. One last question for you before I turn to the, the foreign military experts. Tell me about the East, particularly around Pokrovsk, where you are, as I understand it, under significant pressure. Are you going to hold Pokrovsk, or should we... We are being honest here. Is there at least a risk that you do not? Once again, I'll start from Crimea. In 2014, if partners would not question uh, illegal attempt of annexation, we would have hold it. If partners would have not questioned the East operations, we would hold it. Every meter counts. It's our territory. There's no questions. It's a terrorism to pressurize us, to tell us, should we hold there? It's our territory. We will be punching back. So that's our territory, and we will be fighting there as well. Of course. That's very important. But it's also important that we have realistic conversations. Okay. Uh, so in this regard, we said that uh, we have our defensive operations. We don't announce it, but uh, we're stabilizing it. Is it hard? Yes, it is hard. Do we need more ammunition? Yes, we need ammunition. Do we need more MLRS? Yes, we need. We should not allow them to come closer to us. That's why we ask for 152, 122. We ask for MLRS, Uragan systems, Smash systems, other systems. That's why we voice out to the partners what we need, because we can hold. We have people, we have uh, ability, but we don't have ammunition enough. And it should arrive, because everybody commits, but it doesn't constitute it arrives on time. So that's what we need at the moment to support us. That's very clear, and thank you for being you. honest. Um, I asked you a number of very specific questions, and you were very honest. I'm now, uh, Minister, I will turn to you in a second, but I first want to get a perspective from the two, the two uh, military leaders here. And maybe I will start with you, uh, General Freuding. You are closely involved in assistance to Ukraine. Uh, you're a you know, soldier yourself. When you look at this situation, who do you think is winning? You've just heard the defense minister. And where do you think, if you were giving strategic or indeed tactical advice, where do you think one should be most worried about? And where do you think Ukraine is doing best? Well, um, thank you very much. First of all, I will be very careful to give a military judgment on what the Ukrainians are doing as we are sitting in the sofa in Berlin or Brussels. And what we are really doing is admiring the brevity and the valor of the Ukrainian forces. And uh, that uh, comes to my mind first when I hear your question. Um, secondly, um, I mean, if you compare the situation we had at the beginning of August, there was a kind of stalemate on the front, stalemate which uh, doesn't mean that there was no fierce fighting between the Ukrainian forces and the enemy on every front, um, but there was not so much um, fire and maneuver uh, as we could have expected. And if there is a situation like this, a military commander would always try to find out how he gets into movement, how he gets into maneuver, and he should and must try to gain the initiative wherever he can. And uh, even if there is a calculated risk, and I'm pretty much convinced, and I had the opportunity to, to talk to many Ukrainian friends, especially in the first weeks of the uh, first days of August, um, that the Ukrainians are very much aware about what they are doing, that, that there is a risk in this Kursk incursion, in this Kursk offensive, um, but there are many advantages as well. Um, as far as I uh, could see that, um, it was a proper plan, and extremely proper executed operation and it gained success for the Ukrainian forces. It broke up the stalemate and uh, we keep um, all the fingers crossed that it will be successful. And the rationale for this operation, as Minister Umerov told us already, is completely correct. I will share it in every single point and um, now we will see um, how it goes on. Thank you. And, and one more question for you. Minister Umerov very clearly said that there is a need for more weaponry 
to support and sustain what Ukrainian military is doing. Uh, when you assess this, do you think that Europe is providing enough, fast enough, or you think there should be more faster? We should be more and we should be faster. And we are in more than close cooperation, and I would say even in daily exchange, how we could manage that. Thank you. Um, I, I will resist the temptation to say that your political masters are not always of the same view, but um, thank you. Uh, General Petraeus, um, I'm going to ask you a more abstract question. General Freuding just said it's important to maintain the initiative, and it's important to, to take the initiative when you can. Do you sense you've seen this big change in what had been quite static in the last few months? Do you take that as a very strong positive sign? Oh, I do. And it's not just uh, on the ground. Uh, obviously, the operation into Kursk is hugely impressive. Uh, how do you achieve surprise in today's day of ubiquitous surveillance? It's extraordinary. The way they did it was great operational security. Combined arms operations, not just tanks and infantry, but artillery, air defense, electronic warfare, logistics, all the other elements necessary and orchestrated very impressively and with drones over top of them. Uh, so that is an extraordinary initiative that they took. They achieved complete surprise, found the soft underbelly of the Russians, have exposed their territorial forces and local security forces as being very, very uh, incapable. Uh, and they've hung on to it far longer, I think, than maybe even they expected. I, early on, I was asked, you know, what do you think of this? What are they doing? And I said, there's something in the military that's called developing the situation. You actually have done something, you may, and you've succeeded, and now you're figuring out, what do we do? We develop the situation. And they continue to do it, by the way. They were still on the offensive yesterday, even as the Russians are finally, in a somewhat haphazard way, beginning to respond. Uh, they've done the same thing on the Black Sea. How does a country that has no ships, no, well, no navy to speak of, sink one-third of the mighty Russian Black Sea fleet? It did it with extraordinary skill and technology. Aerial drones to find the ships and then very impressive maritime drones made by Ukraine uh, to sink them. And now they're starting to spread that even farther to begin to put the Black Sea fleet in the eastern uh, part of the Black Sea uh, at threat as well. Keep, keep in mind the Russians didn't just withdraw from the Western Black Sea, they withdrew their last ship from the historic centuries-old port of Sevastopol uh, in Crimea. You see it with technology. Uh, and the man to my right here and all of his comrades uh, really throughout the Ukrainian uh, industry and government have been unbelievable. I've been meeting with him for years now and every time I ask them, how many drones can you make, uh, the number grows up. We're now talking millions with an S on the end. Now, yes, they need money for that. They need some components for that and all the rest of that. And we should be doing uh, more of that and doing it faster. But in terms of seizing the initiatives, the Ukrainians have done that and they've done it very, very impressively. Thank you. I'm going to turn to the minister on your right in a second, but one last question for you. Is it, and you explained very well the, uh, let's say, tactical reason for this incursion into Kursk. Is it, in your view, important that that territory is held, or has the point been made? Um, I, I'm hesitant to, to say yes or no at this point, because it depends on how much the Russians divert. If at some point they divert so many forces, this is already strategic. This is, not, this is a tactical operation that has achieved operational and strategic uh, goals and objectives here. And if it forces the Russians to divert many forces from ideally, particularly the southeast, fantastic. And then maybe you start to slowly give that territory up, being very careful. Obviously, the challenge here is the shoulders of this You've got to make sure that they don't cut it off, and they, and they know this. And I share my German colleagues' reluctance to give advice uh, to those who are actually in combat, having had lots of people second-guessing me and giving me advice uh, from various capitals around the world. And I said, why don't you just come on out here uh, and, and spend some time on the ground? I said, I've been here for four years now, and I'm happy to hear your views, but why don't you just come out here and join us? Uh, and I'm sure that's the way the Ukrainians feel, but they're far too polite 
uh, to say that. But, <laughs> but no, what, what they have done here, I think, is remarkable. Uh, and still developing the situation. And as it develops, it depends on what the Russians do, uh, whether or not you really want to hang on to this, how much do you want to pay for that, if you will. You've achieved something very remarkable. Maybe you go do it somewhere else now. But again, I'm not suggesting that that Thank you. Be the case. Thank you. Um, let's turn now to the more medium term of who has more time. And really, one important part of that is manpower, and I'll come to that to you in a second, Minister. But I want to first talk about uh, Ukrainian weapons production and Ukrainian weapons capability, because as General Petraeus said, it is really remarkable, uh, Minister Commission, or former Minister Commission, now advisor, what you have achieved. I remember meeting you for the first time a year ago, and you were telling me the scale up of production that Ukraine would do, and I confess that I was a little skeptical, uh, and I was wrong. So I am. Uh, I would like to hear now from you, give us a sense of the scale to which Ukraine's domestic military production has scaled up, and what are the biggest constraints you have on scaling it up even further? Thank you, Zeni. Last spring, if we would see whether we can produce enough, we would be quite embarrassed. The beginning of the war, we've got some legacy stocks. Then the Western delivery arrived and we've been relying much on what we've got in the stocks and what was arriving from the West. And we were not probably caring too much on the local production. At some point where we turned to local production, the challenge was to produce. Already now, when we speak about local production, production we would face the reality. It's not already a challenge to produce, it's a challenge to finance. Probably all people on the stage been to some kind of uh, production facilities in Ukraine. General Petroyev spoke to the guy who was driving the naval drone production in Ukraine. He can do more. General Freuden been to a number of production facilities. I'm not speaking about Je Minister Paulson. He personally seen them in the factories. He's seen them on fire range and his leadership in funding local production in Ukraine is something we would always admire and always remember. Minister Rustem Umerov is visiting factories quite often. So all of us, I am Zeni, definitely you've been as well. So each one of us seen the production facilities and each production facility will tell I can do more. All I need is proper funding. So at this point, the limit is not in the production capabilities, it's already in funding. So I'm sure that the leadership of Denmark would be always respected, but other nations can follow, thanks to Minister Olof Green and others as well. And uh, again, uh, yet we are so far from where we need to be, because again, that's the greatest for of generations. But now we are sure we can. Thank you. Um, I'm, uh, that is an you make an incredibly important point, and I'm, I'm just going to re sort of repeat it for emphasis for those people who don't focus too much on this. The, one of the biggest constraints now on Ukraine's domestic military industrial complex is not its production capacity. It is the money to pay for the orders. The Ukrainian companies, the 200 plus Ukrainian companies that make drones, could make many, many more drones. They have the capacity to do it. They just don't have the money for the contracts. And that's something that I've, has really been impressed upon me on this trip. I hadn't realized it, and I suspect there are many others who haven't realized the degree, degree to which this is a financial constraint rather than a production capability constraint. And with that, Minister um, Paulson, I'm going to turn to you because I think it was in April that Denmark became the first non-Ukrainian NATO country to invest in the production of weapons in Ukraine. Can you explain to me why you did this and what you hope to expect from this partnership and whether you would advise your fellow Europeans, fellow NATO members to follow you and do this? Yes, um I think this in initiative uh, was in fact uh, started in in March uh, when I was in, in Kiev and had very uh, good and uh, fruitful meeting with uh, Commission and also Umarov uh, and for instance also Zelensky. At that time, uh, the demand uh, here in, in Ukraine 
was to be able to produce uh, more of, of uh, their own uh, weapons from, from Ukraine defense industry. It was missiles, it was drones, but it was also uh, Bogdana artillery systems. And that was the first deal that Denmark uh, made uh, with the government of Ukraine that was in fact to reimburse uh, 18 uh, artillery systems produced here in, in Ukraine. And just to give some remarks about that, if you are buying artillery systems in, in Europe, I think buying 18 artillery systems in Europe, it will take some years to be delivered. In July, we placed the order for reimbursement and this weekend, the 18 Bogdana systems has been delivered to uh, the Ukrainian forces. So that's amazing speed of time. The second part of this, it's <laughs> the second part is it's also much cheaper to produce it here in, in Ukraine. And the third part is concerning maintenance, spare parts and all that kind of thing, they are able to do it here locally. We have seen some difficulties with donations from uh, the Western countries to maintenance and get spare parts for the equipment here in Ukraine. So they will be more active uh, all over the place in Ukraine because they can uh, get renovated and also maintenance. But uh, the, the way forward now is in fact to encourage more European countries to finance production here in Ukraine. And I think it's also the way forward to give Ukraine what, what they need in the future so they will not be so dependable on donations from the West. So giving more finance for local procurement but also local production, that's also the way forward to give Ukraine um, the idea of, of being a, a free and independent country in the longer run. Thank you. That's very clear. General Petraeus, you wanted to make a quick comment. Yeah, just a, a quick one, and that is to encourage the economists to raise once again the possibility of using the $300 billion equivalent uh, that are frozen in Western countries around the world of Russian reserves. I think it's time to re-examine that issue. I know there was a skillful use of that uh, with the interest on that, but now I think it's time to go after the principal, and I can't imagine a better platform to raise the visibility of me. that. Than, I'm the than moderator. Yours. I'm not a player in this. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, sure. Minister has a word. Yeah. Um, when we uh, last year planned uh, the capabilities and uh, the needs, uh, we have identified how much we can produce jointly in a private and a state sector. And we financed as Ukraine up to $7 billion. So the capacity next year will be three times bigger than we have at the moment. So it is hard to produce with money. It's impossible without money at all. So that is why we encourage to invest into the defense and security sector. This is all Ukrainian military industrial production, $7 billion you can finance. No, we invest yeah, the you only, invest. but we have, as I said, uh, uh, two, three times bigger uh, capabilities than we can uh, and able to finance ourselves. Okay. Minister Paulson. Yeah, uh, I, I'm not sure I can recall the, the numbers, but uh, I think Commission can then. I think the production capacity for Ukrainian defense companies is about 20 billion US dollars. And you have right now about 7 to 8 billion dollars available for investing in your companies. So in fact, 10 to 12 billion dollars would make a real effect here in Ukraine if we are able to find the money. So there's a lot to do. It's not a discussion about capacity. It's a discussion about financing. Thank you. General Freuding, and then back to you, Minister Commission. This has obviously touched a nerve that everyone wants to comment on, which is important. Yes, indeed, um, because I think it's an, uh, another aspect uh, we, should, we should discuss uh, about um, um, if we improve the capacities, the capabilities of the Ukraine industries, we improve an industry which uh, can rely on the experience of the most battle-proven armed forces in Europe. 
I think as a technological innovation, we will thereby uh, gain for, for all European countries, for all NATO uh, countries, will be impressive. And that's why we are pushing a lot uh, to get joint venture between German industries and Ukrainian industries. And this will pay off for everybody. Thank you. Minister, uh, Commission, let me go back to you because uh, you have a, a number of supporters here, I think, on the panel for, for what you are trying to do. Uh, could you paint us, though, a picture? Because I think it's, it's hard to um, really comprehend, particularly when you come from the background of Western defense industries. This is a completely different kind of defense industrial complex. It's 250 plus companies that you are uh, building into your supply chain. But it's also much more fragmented than one might want, right? Because there are p brigades buying drones directly. There are voluntary organizations buying drones and sending them to the front. There is your centralized procurement. You are in charge of creating a military industrial complex. What are the challenges beyond money, that you, the things that you are working on to do this? Because this could be an important part of Europe's future defense too. Well, we got, as you call it, decentralized procurement. We've got critical components uh, deficit. We've got lack of funding. We've been shelled twice a week. And many other challenges. That's what probably other industries will call a challenge. But we never complained. We never call it a challenge, really, indeed. And we keep standing whatever is happening around. I've got the, the, the report on the shellings daily. So as I told you twice a week, our factories are shelled. So whenever our factories are shelled, uh, we count killed, we call, count injured, and we count whether we stop the production or not. We don't stop the production, we keep running. And our production capability for the next year is even higher. So if that's $20 billion for this year, that's 30 for the next one. And it's a big spreadsheet with the company, product, price, quantity, and final amount. We are ready to discuss any of these lines. And the capability is there. The only point that with the local budget, we can fund up to $10 billion, not more. We don't see other sources. So if other nations will follow Danish and Netherlands and other nations' leadership in procuring from Ukrainian producers, we will stand. And I'm speaking to Europeans in the room to US people in the room. One day we will join European Union. One day we will join NATO. And we will join with capabilities. And we will join with the strongest army on the ground, with the best experience. And that's why supporting us, you support yourself tomorrow. Just w <laughs> and one second. And just one more, uh, Minister, before we move on to a different theme, which is Beyond money, and you've, you've very clearly made the case for why the money is important, are there any other restrictions or unnecessary difficulties that you face for getting an essential parts from the outside, export licensing? Is there anything more that would be useful for you to build up as fast as possible this, capability, this industry? Should I call Russians as a difficulty? No? <laughs> Other, other side, like otherwise, we wouldn't mention any difficulties, actually, and our armed forces cope pretty well with those difficulties. So there's, there's nothing more that the Europeans need to do other than provide money for this? Well, if I will start listing and numbering all the challenges we have, if I would do the other, like other people do, trust me, we'll have a long, long list, but that's something that we got used to cope on our own. That's something we don't ever name as the challenge to you. We are fine with that. We stand. Thank you. We Thank talk you. about the list afterwards. Thank it, you. General Petraeus, briefly, because yeah, I'd like to get yeah. a couple of comments. Look, you know, you, you uh, described us as supporters. We're much more than supporters. We're admirers of what the Ukrainians have done. It is something we cannot do. Their production, the agility of it, the innovation, the constant adaptation to what the Russians are doing on the battlefield, especially with electronic warfare, this is remarkable. And we need to learn from this. We, should, we cannot do this with our industries at home. Okay. Uh, and we need to overhaul yeah. also, by the way, the battlefield concepts, which actually drive everything else. Uh, but 
no other country in the world is doing what Ukraine has been doing and continues to do. I think that's a very, very important point that perhaps a subject for a future yes panel because there are concrete lessons for NATO partners, the things that they cannot do. Yes, Minister. I think Ukraine already known for the <clears throat> to the world with its bravery. But I think one virtue of Ukraine is also creativity. Why? Because it was a creativity that brought us to the increase of efficiency, productivity, effectiveness. And that's why uh, we, our people, were very super creative when we uh, given the task, what we need, uh, what, and they created the capability. So that is why we, as ministry, said we are able to co-invest with you, we are able to open up joint ventures with you, or we can introduce you to anyone that you wish to work. So uh, creativity is also a product and a virtue. So that brought us to the possibility to increase our capabilities. Absolutely true. Um, I, I'm going to go and turn to two commenters from the floor, but before I do that, and I don't want to put a dampener on this very important conversation, but... It is not only Ukraine that is increasing its capabilities. Russia is also increasing its capabilities. So perhaps you and then Mr. Kamishin could give us an assessment of how fast and how well you think Russia is increasing its capabilities. Where are you ahead and where are you most worried that they are ahead or have greater medium-term strength? Uh, first of all, the oil, gas, steel, metals, chemical, minerals, machinery, every income that they get monthly, they now redirect. They took all the money from the West and redirect to the defense sector. So basically, sanctions, uh, restrictions did not, were not stopped. Plus, the evasion of the uh, sanctions through the uh, partner countries that Russia has. So, of course, with the money, they increased it because uh, up to 40 countries are just bringing the electronic equipment that is uh, uh, used in high-precision missiles, for example. So basically speaking, their supply chain management has been uh, tremendous for the last uh, two and a half years, but at the moment they are tripling their production as well. What we can do, they are limited with only their money, we don't have a money and we create this opportunity. So if we invest, the eff effectiveness and efficiency will increase the productivity. So that is why we say that one dollar that you invest in Ukraine makes a 10x, let's say, multiple. So that is why if we will be having investments from our partners, it's also a trust. It's a building of industrial base. It's uh, uh, capabilities that we could fight with asymmetric. That's what is the difference, because we want to fight asymmetric towards them. Yeah. Mr. Kamishin, from, from your perspective, when you look at their drone capability, their missile capability, they are obviously getting missiles from some of their uh, new allies. Uh, where, are they, where do you see the greatest gap? Where are they building up strength where you need to run even harder? I don't analyze them as their as the military analysis, I do analyze them as a comparative efficiency analysis compared to us. We are definitely lagging behind in, in, in terms of quantity because yes, we're increasing drastically, but they increase even more. They've got funding, they've got the vertical uh, control over the industry and they run it in a proper way. We've got horizontal line in the industry. We've got hundreds of producers. Yes, we got, uh, there are pros and cons in this kind of the model. But finally, uh, I believe that the Minister, Minister Stemov is definitely more capable to speak about the Russian uh, capabilities and their uh, plans and their results. Maybe I could ask General Freuding you about this, because I'm sure uh, the German military is looking very carefully at the kinds of um, capabilities the Russians have and the kind of difference that these new agreements they have with Iran and other, um, I won't use axis of evil, but whatever, they're, they're kind of um, quasi partners. Um, how do you as a professional military man see the potential capabilities they have? Um, of course, we look with great concern um, towards this development, especially uh, to the development we 
um, have seen during the last uh, weeks and months. I think therefore it's even more important um, to um, support the Ukrainian armed forces with regard uh, to not only normal military support items, but bring them into the position to make use of their creativity, to make use of a kind of asymmetry. I think this is key for being successful in this war. This is key for the Ukrainian victory, especially if it comes to time, which is also a topic of our panel. Um, and I think there is not only the question of tangible support, but also the question of how we can support them in training. Um, uh, Germany and all our NATO partners invest a lot in training for the Ukrainian armed forces. And I think that this is a field where we can not invest only even more, um, but where we can um, enable um, the Ukrainian armed forces to be, um, to be asymmetric in their approach, in their tactical approach, which helps us on the other way around to learn lessons from this war for our armed forces, uh, which in the long run, in this, uh, if you come from a strategic perspective, is even more um, important as we will make use of these, um, of these learnings and in our strategic deterrence posture. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Commission, you wanted to make a quick point. Yep, I'll give you the understanding of the Russian figures. You probably know the figures for our defense budget. It's public, it's open, and I'll give you the figures for the Russian one. They've got $112 billion dollars of the official budget for defense for this year. On top of that, they've got up to 40 coming from state companies, and that's private military companies and all the equipment on top of that. So it's hard to fight with the budget we have against the budget of roughly $150 billion. And I would be fair and frank, our defense industry was not always running well. It was great in Soviet times. For decades, it was quite neglected, and Russians never stopped. They, they've been always fighting, and they've been always producing. So we are fighting against $150 billion budget. I would like to give a special thanks to those companies, Ukrainian businesses sitting in the room, and volunteer funds buying Ukrainian equipment. I would not name you for the security reason, but trust me, without all the help you have, it would be quite complicated. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Minister Umerov, we've talked a lot, and rightly so, about weaponry and Ukrainian military capability. The other uh, aspect of the medium term and who, who benefits from time is people, manpower, soldiers, size of army, potential, how well-trained your soldiers are, as General Freuding says. How much of a challenge is that for you? How is mobilization going? Do you have a problem of morale? How can you ensure that you have an armed forces that is one that can sustain this for the medium term? Sure, it's a um, discussion that took a year ago, uh, how to mobilize, where to mobilize. And uh, we start with paradigm changes because we said, serving your nation is an honor, not a punishment. And that was a doctrinal change, let's a paradigm change. And we went to the parliament, we explained uh, what are Russians going to do, how much they will increase, how many brigades they will have, and to withstand and repel, to deter them, we will need such and such numbers. So we started this discussion and I think all the uh, society was very actively watching us but we created a rules perimeter where we said we will engage in, in basic training, engage in uh, specialized training, engage in collective training, and then we will put you steadily to the ground. But to our main fundamental thing is to focus on person and to save lives. So that is why we started investing into the uh, military capabilities to have this asymmetric warfare because we shall not fight with a, just a human capital because that's what is our, what makes us uh, brave, but we save the human lives and we put the technology uh, in front of us and capabilities in front of us. So uh, 
to make it humanized, we went to public and digitalized it because we needed to understand how many people live in the country, how many are uh, eligible to be drafted to the military. To understand the perimeter, we introduced the, the Reserve Plus app and we have uh, more than 5 million people registered there. Uh, and we put all the verticals, horizontals, then the society said, let's not draft from 18 to 25. So we said, okay, from 25 to 60, how much? So we are constantly working, but the emphasis is on the uh, making the rules set uh, with one thing, justice. It should be just, understandable, clear, and to, to develop the human capital, you have to always to be... Uh, uh, to be investing into the a uh, explaining the rules, explaining the perimeter, how he enters to the perimeter, what will happen in the perimeter, how we will train them, how we will equip them, how he will get to the operations. And since the war is uh, uh, going on, we are taking this challenge uh, uh, with all different dimensions, legal dimension, strategic communication dimension, training dimension, equipment dimension, uh, technological dimensions, because why our fundamental is the uh, human life. So it's a hard, but uh, w we're tackling it. You, you've explained how you do that very clearly. I have now a, a naive question. Um, I'm not, a, not in any way a military expert, not even a military journalist. You have, however, after two and a half years of war, your most experienced soldiers, you've lost many of them, and the ones who remain are tired. They've been at the front for a long time. The people who were most keen to volunteer in the early days of the full-scale invasion have already volunteered. So the people you are now recruiting are probably people who don't particularly want to be there, who are being mobilized, who are not experienced soldiers. How do you create and quickly train a military force of the sort that General Freuding was saying when he said it was very important to provide training? Does this become harder the longer the war goes on? Uh, when I started a year ago, it was uh, super hard because you had to explain and you had to recruit, but you have to offer something. So uh, there was initiatives, let's say, do we pay a lot? Uh, what is Russia doing? What is Europe doing? How to feel comfortable? What does the perimeter mean? How he will exit from the perimeter after war, during the war, if he wounded? So, as I said, it's uh, human capital should be developed. And that is why the, uh, we are creating a nation that is not only brave, but the paradigm, as I said, to serve your nation is an honor, not a punishment. So this is a paradigm change. And to change this paradigm, it takes a lot of efforts, uh, and efforts from the childhood uh, care, let's say, until the death. So that is why, to protect this land, we need to protect it from the uh, enemies, but to serve it, you need to understand the rules. So that is why it's a challenging question, 300 degrees, but we're involved. So at this stage, we say to save lives, we need to invest in technology, in capability, and to be asymmetric. And to have people educated, we need to uh, raise them through all the life cycle uh, so that they could choose it. That is why we give an uh, offer to choose to serve. For example, for those we are thinking, for those who are outside, to offer uh, to join the Ukrainian legion that we are working on, so that they could have a choice and uh, they make a decision rather than we force. So, Do you think Ukraine will, like Israel, forever have to have some kind of a requirement for military service? I think we are on the right side, but in a hard neighborhood. So that is why, let's say, a long time ago, the European understanding was during the, in the border of Poland and Ukraine. Now we see that the civilization starts in the border between Ukraine and Russia. So we are uh, in the midst of this Eurasian, European, Asian, let's say, territory. So that would be always challenged, but we need to be prepared. And 100% in this equation, the partners should be a part of the solution.
I think the answer was yes, but um, you were saying it diplomatically. Yeah. Uh, we are now going to move to two comments from the floor. First, can I call on Katerina Matanova, who is the EU ambassador to Ukraine? Um, thank you very much. Uh, good uh, morning. I would like to go back to the previous round of uh, exchanges and uh, echo what the ministers were saying. And General Petraeus also calling on all of us to invest in uh, Ukrainian defense uh, technology and defense industry. Uh, maybe this comes from an unsuspecting corner from the European institutions. Uh, in August of this year, we have, in fact, disbursed 1.4 million from frozen, billion, sorry, from frozen Russian assets. Yes, I very much agree with the notion that all of it should be confiscated. Russia should pay for the destruction it has caused. But while that's being negotiated, uh, and while there are discussions about 50 billion loan, etc., we have legislated and seized the proceeds and disbursed 1.4 billion out of which 400 million went directly to Ukrainian industry through our Danish uh, uh, friends, and thanks a lot for that. And we are preparing to do another batch of more than twice than that. So it's not quite the 7 billion, but it's going to go quite a, quite a big way. And uh, this is something that should be done on a systematic basis because I very much agree it's cheaper, it's faster, you cut away the logistics and the transport, and it pays taxes, so it keeps the economy running. So I think this is a winning solution. I've been advocating this uh, vocally also in the US, but uh, I think that the more that we invest in the uh, Ukraine uh, tech, the better. And the other thing we can also learn is to do better strategic communication on our side, since this uh, probably was news to people. You know, you also, though, you created a $50 billion uh, gift to Ukraine, actually a loan to re Ukraine as well, based on that three, four hundred billion of frozen assets. Uh, and it was some financial, uh, very inc impressive financial engineering that enabled you to do that also. That was announced right before the Munich Security Conference. Uh, this past year. Thank you. Actually, Minister Poulsen, maybe I will turn to you here because that's a very <clears throat> important and interesting point that the ambassador made. One, you have started this bilaterally. It is Denmark uh, agreeing these contracts. Uh, but it could also be done at the EU level as part of the EU defense initiative. What is your sense of the um, appetite amongst your fellow EU members to do a joint move in this direction and indeed to follow you in a bilateral move? I, I think uh, the appetite is, uh, is getting bigger, in fact. Uh, I've talked uh, with quite uh, many of my colleagues uh, and I think uh, they are looking to the results of what we have been doing uh, together with our Ukrainian friends, uh, especially this uh, Bogdana case uh, has uh, been a showcase for quite many countries. I expect that some of my Nordic uh, colleagues uh, will do the same or will give uh, money so Denmark uh, could uh, finance uh, more uh, capabilities uh, buying here directly in, in Ukraine. I think also uh, that we will see that the European Union and also the Commission would be more active in the future. And the ambassador has raised a, a, a very relevant uh, question and also uh, giving comments. And uh, right now Denmark uh, is responsible for um, investing 400 million euros uh, the couple of months directly to the Ukrainian defense uh, companies on behalf of the European Union. So that the outcome of the, the frozen assets, uh, that would be investing directly 400 million euros. I think next year it would be possible maybe to invest about a billion uh, euros directly on, on behalf of the European Union here uh, in Ukraine in, in the defense industry. So we are moving, but it's not that difficult. More countries could do the same. So that will also be uh, my message here today that uh, it's not that uh, difficult. It is uh, only uh, a matter of getting uh, money to, to help our Ukrainian friends. Thank you. Mr. Commission. Minister Paulson is quite 
a modest guy and Danish people are quite uh, silent people, uh, doing more, speaking less. But I would just explain how much is behind it. Because again, trust me, it's a big bureaucracy behind defense procurement. Uh, we finished the evening yesterday by 10 p.m. with Minister and his team and we started this morning at 7.30 together with the whole his team. So there is a big work behind it. I've got no tattoos, but if one day I will make it, it would be a Danish flag. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd now like to, to call on Swasti Rao, who is going to give us a perspective uh, from India, which I think is an important part of this, because how countries in the rest of the world see the medium term and see whether time is on Ukraine's side or on Russia's side is very, very important, I think. So, Swasti, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. And I, uh, well, it's a pleasure to be here. I've been working on the war for the last uh, three years now, and it's my first time in Ukraine. So thank you for the, uh, for the invitation. Uh, I've been asked to be brief, so I've jotted down, you know, my points so that I don't miss any because there's a lot I want to say. Uh, well, for first, I work with the Ministry of Defense think tank in India. And when the war started, of course, uh, you know, we were, uh, we were asked to make certain assessments of where the war is going. And everybody was, con you know, very sure that the war is not going to go beyond uh, 10 days or two weeks at the max and we all, all all have been proved wrong so this is also sort of forced the Indian strategic community to sort of relook at what is happening in the war so very quickly about uh, today uh, how do we look at the war especially from India's perspective and national interest there are about four points that I would like to share with you and would like to hear back from you on the first is that I don't think that anybody in India buys the argument really that Russia is winning the war because uh, well what has happened in the Black Sea is a case in point uh, uh, it, this has been mentioned about how the greater Odessa ports exports have resumed. So the other thing which uh, is more relevant from India's perspective is the collapse of Russian export, uh, you know, uh, export of the arms. So before the war, it was about, you know, going to 31 countries. Now it's going only to about 12 countries. And India, as you know, has a very old historic dependence on Russian arms that we're trying very hard to diversify from. The other point that really makes us very um, concerned is the deepening of the strategic alignment between Russia and China and also the uh, the higher probability of uh, Chinese equipment in Russian uh, you know weapons which also sort of raises questions on where our relationship with Russia is going especially in the defense sector uh, then of course uh, on the battlefront we totally see that the progress made by the Russians remains very slow it's a very static battlefront and um, at the same time we've also been seeing that Russia has not been able to um, actually exploit the windows to really finish the war when Ukraine has been outgunned and outmanned and this has really taken a lot of traction um, the other thing that I'd like to mention here is the second point, which is that from our perspective, which is a very relevant point, is that I don't know whether Europe is winning or losing the war, but I for sure know from my work is that Europe is getting completely transformed because of the war in Ukraine. And Europe is in the way of revamping its security landscape, its defense industrial base. The ed tip is very much now released. And, you know, we have had very productive discussions in India about how uh, this opens up space for the Indian, uh, you know, defense exports to, and, you know, more, having more meaningful cooperation with not just uh, individual European partners, because, as you know, we are making a new strategic partnership with a lot of countries, Poland being one, uh, which is very recent because Prime Minister was here, but also with Brussels at large. Uh, so, you know, we are sort of looking at how the European transformation opens up opportunities for India because India-Europe ties are also very uh, unprecedented high right now. Uh, then I would say that, yes, India has a very legitimate role in stabilizing the European theater, whether it's through, you know, economic opportunities or strategic opportunities and the war in Ukraine, of course, then becomes a very important determinant. The third and a very important point that I'd like to say is that I think in the West, a lot of people sort of always get very uh, hung up about India's multi-alignment. But I think one needs to look a little deeper about what India's multi-alignment is because it is actually not an equal distribution. What is happening right now, um, very quickly, is that India is in a, is in a process of dehyphenating its ties with, with Russia on the one hand and with West and Ukraine on the other hand. Um, and uh, the military performance 
performance of Ukraine in the battlefront and the willingness of the West, the resolve of the West to actually support Ukraine is going to be a determinant of how we really substantiate this dehyphenation. So on the one hand, we know that our ties with Russia will prevail, it will change. Now we are buying oil, but at the same time, like I said, that we have legit interest in stabilizing the European theater and our ties, technical military cooperation with Ukraine is something which is very important to us. And. Um, Finally, just uh, this is my last point, which is that uh, India, you know, Prime Minister Modi was here and uh, India is really interested in the reconstruction of Ukraine. And ultimately, this is going to open opportunities for private Indian uh, firms uh, for investments, you know, in Ukraine. And that way, uh, actually, Ukraine could become an important strategic gateway for India into Europe. So this is how we actually assess the war. And thank you for your time. Looking forward to hearing back. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I think... You, you made a number of important points, which if we had more time would be worth important to discuss. But one, that it is, I think, telling that you think that nobody in India believes Russia is winning. I think that's important. And secondly, that you see European military industrial complex being transformed. I'm now going to very rudely call only on our two Europe, uh, Ukrainian ministers, because we have very little time. But very briefly, uh, Minister Omerov, I want you to end because... As any journalist will tell you, repetition is the art of people understanding things. Can you close this session, and then I'll, I'll, talk, I'll ask Minister Kamishin to do the same, just repeating for this audience, you've laid out, I think very eloquently, what uh, Ukraine's staying power is. What do you most need from Europe in particular, from this audience going forward? What's the takeaway you want to leave them with? compromises bring and pave the way for the war to be faster we need uh, fast decisions brave decisions money weapons and support money weapons and support thank you and mr commission um you painted a picture last year of how Ukraine would transform its military production. You were right, uh, you have transformed it. Paint us a picture of what things will look like in terms of Ukrainian capability when we all meet here next year. I'm sure, I'm not a painter, I can't. I'm the factory guy, I'm the management guy. And uh, I can't tell you where we'll be in the next year, but I'm sure that we'll sit in the same room in a safe uh, place in Kyiv, and uh, we will be uh, ready forever, standing for our land. I would like to thank our, all part partner nations, all countries of the free world, for standing with us for already 934 days. Never we would be capable to withstand without all that help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. I think we had a very clear sense of, of what is needed and what indeed Ukraine is capable of and is creating. And it is not just a Ukrainian military industrial complex. This is going to be Europe's defense industrial complex.